Hi everyone and welcome to lab number nine which focuses on conjugation. So I know you're all pros at this now but as a reminder we have to just before we get into conjugation remind you what the three main forms of bacterial gene transfer are. So in this figure the first one that you see here is one that you have done a lot with in our course so that's transformation. Okay, so for transformation, you notice that it is a naked piece of DNA, meaning a piece of DNA all by itself. It's not within any other cell, and it is entering a bacterial cell. Okay, so that's how the new DNA enters in transformation. The second one that we have here, that one is transduction. And in this one, this structure here, that is a viral vector known as a bacteriophage. Okay, so circle star highlight that word. A bacteriophage is the virus that injects the DNA. So that pink line that you see there is the DNA getting injected into the bacterial cell by the virus known as the bacteriophage. Because when you see phage in biology, that end portion of the word, that means virus. And bacteriophage tells you that it's a virus infecting the bacteria. The last one is the one that we're going to focus on today, which is conjugation. And that's the one I always tell you, you can think of as bacteria sex. Okay, because in that case, you have one bacterial cell transferring DNA to a second bacterial cell. And this structure here, you'll see it referred to as two things. First, it starts out as a pillus. So a pillus or pili that then becomes what you see there known as the conjugation bridge. And we're going to talk about that later, okay? But for what conjugation means, again, it is the transfer of DNA from one bacterial cell to another, okay? So make sure you write that down as what conjugation means. So now before we get into the details of conjugation, there are a few things that you have to know. First of all, not all bacteria can undergo conjugation. In order to undergo conjugation, bacteria must have what we call transferability. Transferability. And it's one word, but it kind of tells you everything you need to know in terms of what it's making these bacteria able to do, it's the ability to transfer DNA. And the reason these bacteria have what's called transferability is because they have a particular plasmid called the F plasmid. And that F stands for fertility. So it's the fertility plasmid. And the reason that this plasmid allows for it, or how it's actually allowing for conjugation and the transfer of this plasmid, is because it codes for something called trigenes, like the beginning of transfer. Okay, so the fertility plasmid codes for approximately or up to 20 genes that we call the tra genes. Okay, and those are basically transfer genes. Okay, they're genes needed for transferring DNA. And specifically included in those tra genes are the genes to make two very important structures, which I already wrote on the previous slide, but just to remind you, the two structures that are coded by the tra genes that are necessary for conjugation are the sex pillus, which you see right here. Okay, so the sex pillus is right here. And 
that eventually becomes what's called the conjugation bridge. Okay, so it's at first the sex pillus, which is basically like a lasso. So the plasmid, uh, sorry, the bacteria that has the F plasmid will make the pillus and it, it will then use it like a lasso to grab a hold of the other bacteria to keep it close to it. Because remember, conjugation is like bacteria sex, which means they need close contact. Once it then brings that other bacteria close to it, that pillus ends up opening up into a conjugation bridge, which is the structure that you saw in the previous slide and can see again over here, if you look at this figure that I'm circling in blue right now, um, that conjugation bridge is basically like any bridge or a tunnel that allows the plasmid to then transfer a copy into the second bacteria. And you're going to see after exactly how that works and what I mean by a copy or a strand. Um, but for now, just understand sex pillus and conjugation bridge. And the reason the bacteria is able to form that is because it is F plus meaning it has a fertility plasmid. So I'm going to draw F plus over this side, okay, so that you see that the bacteria that have the plasmid, which is that ring with the, uh, the red little piece in it, okay, and then notice at the very end, we're going to talk about this later, this one here is also F plus. So whenever you see that little plasmid, it's F plus, the ones that do not have the plasmid are called F minus, which you're gonna see in a later slide. Okay, and now with this type of gene transfer, it is called horizontal gene transfer. Okay, so let me clear all of this so that you can kind of focus a little better now on horizontal gene transfer which makes sense because if you look at the figure over here, horizontal gene transfer for conjugation, <clears throat> you notice that we have the transfer from left to right, okay? Now what horizontal gene transfer actually means is you are transferring DNA <clears throat> from two organisms, usually in a sexual reproduction manner, but they are not related organisms. <clears throat> Whereas vertical gene transfer, which you see on this side, vertical gene transfer is the transfer of genes from a parent to offspring. Okay, so vertical is always parent to offspring. So for instance, mom having a baby and passing on genes to the baby Okay, well, mom and dad passing on genes to that baby. But the reason I use that example is because vertical, I like the students to picture a pregnant woman standing straight up, and then what happens? Plop, the baby plops vertically right out of her, falls downward, okay? Versus horizontal, if you've ever heard horizontal mambo or any kind of, you know, ways that people refer to sexual activity, horizontal gene transfer is through sexual contact or any transfer of genes from two unrelated organisms, okay? Okay, so you kind of got to see the process a little bit in some figures so far, but let's draw out the process so that you can go step by step. So you have two bacteria and for purposes of fitting better on the screen, I'm going to show them top and bottom, okay? Even though, again, this is a horizontal transfer, so keep in mind horizontal gene transfer. So you have two bacteria that are now joined together by their conjugation bridge, okay? So over here, let's say bridge is this structure here. You have both of them having their big chromosomal DNA, and notice I'm drawing it double-stranded. That's why it looks uh, like that. That's to show that DNA is always double-stranded. And then one of the bacteria has an extra little plasmid, 
Okay, and that extra little plasmid, remember, is an F plasmid, a fertility plasmid. So the bacteria that has that right now is called F plus. That will then donate some of that plasmid DNA to the currently F minus cell. Okay, so this F plus is the donor cell, and this F minus is the recipient cell, okay? And it uses its trigenes to form that pilus and to form that bridge now. And then what happens once there's that bridge, you still have those two bacteria linked together. Sorry, my drawing is a little sloppy on this uh, touch screen. Okay, you still have them having their full chromosomal DNA, each of them. And then what happens is that double-stranded little plasmid, one of the strands, the outer strand, gets nicked by an endonuclease. And as you know, nicked by an endonuclease means that it gets cut by a nuclease. But notice when it's nicked, it's only one of the two. And so, sorry, the pen is acting up. Let me erase that mark. So that one strand, what happens is it then travels into the other bacteria. Okay, so it was double-stranded plasmid, but one strand of the double-stranded, so I'll put DS for double-stranded plasmid, got nicked by an endonuclease, okay? Nicked by an endonuclease and moved through the conjugation bridge, okay? Now that single strand that is entering the recipient cell, that now will serve as a template for bidirectional replication. Okay, what that means is now you have one strand left of the plasmid in the original donor cell, and now you have one strand in the second cell. But as you know, in any cell, you can never just have single-stranded DNA. It has to be double-stranded. So what both of these cells will now do is use bidirectional replication, okay, which you don't have to worry about the details of that, okay, you go into that in lecture, but they'll use a process to make the complement, to synthesize the complement of each of the single strands so that both now have the proper double strands, okay? So that would basically be the final step where you have your two bacteria Okay, they're getting ready to let go of that conjugation bridge, but I'll still show it in this figure. They both have the regular double-stranded uh, chromosomal DNA that did not get affected at all during conjugation, and now they both have double-stranded plasmid. Okay, again, because the complement was synthesized. Okay, so in your notes, make sure that you write that the donor, which again was F plus, donated one strand of its double-stranded plasmid into the recipient cell. And then by doing that, by donating that one strand, okay, both of the cells ended up with a single strand 
And ultimately, they both were then able to synthesize the complements. So they both ended up with double-stranded DNA. Okay, and so for that, now that you see they both have a plasmid, now, and so now that the, the recipient also has a plasmid, now it's no longer, it's no longer F minus, it is now F plus as well. Okay, so it started out that the donor was F plus and the recipient was F minus, meaning the recipient did not have any F plasmid, but in the end, they are both F plus. Okay, if you have any questions about any part of this diagram or what the process actually is, just send me a message in the Remind app and I will go through it step by step or clarify any issues, okay? So, sorry, the pen wasn't working for a second. So, expected result. You expect strain 2 to have given strain 1, that plasmid, okay, and then it makes the complement. And so, that would give it amp resistance in addition to the strep resistance it already has. But what doesn't it have? I'll change the color does not have this one here because that was in strain two and never got transferred. That's chromosomal DNA that does not have trogenes on it, okay? It does not have transferability. Only the plasmid could get transferred. So you expect the final strain, expected result, final strain, which we'll call strain three, to have amp resistance and strep resistance, but no NAL resistance, okay? So strain three, the final product of this conjugation should be able to survive ampicillin and streptomycin, but should not grow on naladixic acid, okay? Circle star highlight that fact that will come into play later on when we're looking at potential results. Okay, so just to, to draw this out, in case you missed that, what we expect at the end. Okay, so let's take a quick look at the actual protocol of how this experiment would be done. Now, you are already familiar with strain one and strain two and what that means. So again, remind yourself that strain one is the strain that had STR on its chromosome. Sorry, that, that handwriting is, is horrible. Uh, <laughs> it had the streptomycin resistance on its chromosome. And E. coli strain 2 is the one in the earlier slides that had the naladixic acid resistance on its chromosome and the AMP resistance on its plasmid, okay? And so make sure you keep going back to that original picture to remind yourself kind of what should happen. Now, in the first part of the protocol, what you would do is you would take these five agar plates that we have here, and you would put a line, draw the, the line you, you wouldn't actually have in the agar. It's something that you draw on the bottom of the plate, which you then see when you're streaking the plate. And what you would do is you would put a little bit of strain one on each of the plates. See? there, okay? Sometimes you just pipette it on, sometimes you swab it on, or you could take a loop and zigzag it on there. It's, it's not particular, this experiment, as long as you get some of strain one on each of the plates that you see here, and then do the same thing with strain two, making very sure, so you notice all here, these are all strain two, you would make very sure that you do not allow them to touch each other, okay? So you would put them on their appropriate side 
of the picture and you would not let them cross contaminate each other. Now, what these plates are called, these are the conformation plates. Okay, the reason you set up these conformation plates, you'll notice one of them is regular LB, which as we went through in transformation and other experiments, we said LB is their nice, nutrient-rich media, nothing bad in it, nothing that should kill any of the strains. That's usually a control plate to test for the viability of cells. Okay, so that first one, we always use the first plate. I'll put a square around it. First plate that's just plain LB, that's a control to test viability of the cells, the bacteria. Okay, meaning checking to make sure that they're healthy and able to survive in regular conditions. And then you'll notice each of the other plates. So I'm gonna erase all the ink on this slide so that you can then see each of the other plates contains antibiotics, the various antibiotics that we've mentioned in this lesson so far. And the reason you do that is you want to test both strains to confirm their initial or original resistance or sensitivity to the various antibiotics. That way you can see, okay, yes, we say that on paper, strain one should only have streptomycin resistance, but you never know in the lab if something got contaminated, maybe you know the, the background information was wrong. So this confirms, so why do we do this? To confirm the initial resistances and sensitivity of each starting strain to the antibiotics. And so if you go back to our other picture from, from a couple of slides ago, you'll be able to see that you expect, for instance, strain one to be able to grow on the regular LB because there's no antibiotics to kill it. And you expect strain one to be able to grow on the plate that contains just streptomycin. You expect it to then die or get killed off and have no growth on the other three plates because it does not have ampicillin resistance. It does not have naledixic acid resistance. And on the plate that has strep and amp, it would be able to survive the strep, but what would kill it on that plate is the ampicillin. Okay, so make sure you're very comfortable with each of the strains what you're expecting. Strain two, you're expecting something very different. Okay, so what I want you to do now is in remind, message me what are you expecting for strain two with these plates. And I'll say with each of these plates, because I want you to tell me, okay, what do you expect to happen on the LB plate, on the second plate, on the third plate, the fourth, and why? Tell me why. Okay, and if you're not sure what you're expecting, that's okay. All you have to do is send me the message and remind with a picture of this slide saying, I don't know what I'm expecting for strain two. Can you help me? Okay, so either give me what you're expecting or tell me that you honestly, you, you're lost. You don't, you don't know. It's okay to admit that because we're not up to a quiz or an exam. So it's better to tell me now so I could re-explain it, okay? Okay, then we get to the next part of the protocol. 
Once you have set up your confirmation plates, then you set up what's called the mating plate. Okay, don't worry, this is still PG-13, okay? So what you ultimately do is you take a plate and on that plate, you take one section where you put some strain one. You take one section where you put some strain two. You then mix them together in the rest of the plate, okay? So they're like your little stock section over here. You're like a stock solution for you. And the purpose of having them over there is that later in the experiment, you'll see you don't expect growth on each of those little sections because on our experiment, when we do this in lab, we do this on an LB strep plus amp plate. Call it killing two birds with one stone, right? So you mix them together, one and two, to then make your strain three. Okay, so you would put strain one and strain two on the plate, and then you would have a section where you mix them together. That's for them, that's an area for them to mate, to create strain three. And again, if you're not sure what we mean by strain three, go back to the picture earlier where we had strain one mating with strain two and what was then strain three. So now when you kind of try to visualize what's going on here, like I said, this is LB, this will have both antibiotics, okay? So you expect strain one to get killed in the first section, to get killed strain two in the second section, okay? Strain one gets killed plate and strain two then gets killed by the streptomycin on the plate. But in this section of the plate, the mating area, okay, when you mix them together, any of the cells that are the product of conjugation in that area where you mix them together, they will be able to survive on the strep amp, okay? So why do we then do this to have conjugation occur? And ultimately what that does is produce strain three. That's the goal of this mating plate. So whenever in the later pictures and results, when you see any plate that looks like this, that tells you it is a mating plate and strain three was created in this section here. Okay, and the reason it survives again is because conjugation occurred. So it didn't get killed off by the strep and amp. Okay, if you have any questions or concerns, just contact me in the Remind app. Now, the last part of the experiment that what you would do is once you have the results of your mating plate, because conjugation, it actually takes us a few weeks to do because first you set up the initial confirmation plates, then you set up the mating plate. You know, in a lot of labs, we do that all in the same week. And then in the following week, once you have the results of the mating plate, so this is results of mating plate. Okay, so again, you notice there's no growth here because strain one got killed by the ampicillin. You have no growth here because strain two got killed by the streptomycin. It doesn't have that resistance. And then you have growth here. And what is this growth? That growth is strain three. Okay, strain three, or you could write it as strain Roman numeral three. Okay. Strain three is the product of the conjugation. Okay, that's the one 
that was initially strain one, but now has the F plasmid from strain two. Now to confirm exactly which strain donated to which, because we know because of the background information which it should be, but to really confirm that it was strain two giving only its plasmid to strain one and nothing happening in terms of transferring the chromosomal DNA, the final part of this protocol, you take a plate that is LB now, okay? So it has maledixic acid. And you take strain three and you streak it on this plate, okay? So you take, you streak, strain three on naladixic acid. Okay, now what are you expecting? What do you know about strain three? Well, strain three should have been strain one who had streptomycin resistance gaining the ampicillin resistant plasmid from strain two. What should not have been transferred? The chromosome the chromosomal DNA of strain two, okay? So you are expecting that strain three should just have AMP and streptomycin resistance. You are expecting no growth. And why is that? Because you expect that strain two gave its plasmid to strain one, and that there was never any transfer of the chromosomal naledixic uh, resistance, okay? This no growth will confirm that it was strain two giving a plasmid to strain one rather than strain one giving anything to strain two. Because if our recipient was strain two, then strain three would be naledixic acid resistant because it already had that resistance. You never lose anything in conjugation, you're only gaining. And so this final part of the protocol, the reason we do this is to confirm which bacteria was the donor, which was the recipient, and what actually got transferred. Okay, so confirms. Strain two, I'll abbreviate, strain two was donor, strain one was recipient, and only plasmid gets transferred. Okay, so that's why we do this final step. Make sure you are comfortable with what you're expecting and why you are expecting that. The last thing I want to do with this slide is I'm going to give you a second Remind app question this week. Okay, think of it as because one of the weeks you didn't have any. So now you get two. Because I want to ask you, with this mating result plate, what if you got the result where strain three had growth, but so did both of these areas here, okay? So in the Remind app, okay, so I'm gonna draw, draw it right here in case you're fast forwarding, you see that there's another Remind, Remind app. So Remind message, okay? Send me a Remind app message of what you would analyze, what would you say happened if you get the results of a mating plate and there's growth in all three sections, okay? What might have caused this? And don't go Googling this or anything. I'm not testing the internet. You're not getting, you know, points for an exam or extra credit or anything. This is for me to kind of get you to start thinking like a scientist, because like I've said before, troubleshooting is the most important part of science. Okay, so if you don't have any clue of what could have caused growth there, okay, based on what you know from previous transformation lessons, for instance, 
If you have no clue, that's okay. Send me a line that message where you say, I have no clue what have what could have caused growth in all three sections of the mating plate. Can you go through it with me? That's perfectly fine. I respect that and it's how you learn. If you just send me something that you copied from Google, I don't respect that and you then also fail my class if you start using internet sources. So please, you know, send me what you think it would mean if you saw growth on all of these sections. Okay, that now brings us to the final portion of the lesson where you get to analyze the results in your post lab. Now I know sometimes these pictures can be a little tough to see because, you know, again, the virtual world is not perfect. So I will just write above each one just so that you can be very clear on what each plate is. The first plate is LB. Actually, sorry, I will write it above so you can really see it on the white section. Okay, so LB plate. The second one is LB plus streptomycin. Okay, so it has antibiotic streptomycin. This one has the antibiotic ampicillin on both sides. The whole plate has it. So don't get mixed up when you see the line down the middle. That line is just so that you know where to streak strain one and strain two. But the whole plate has amp. And this final plate, the whole plate has maledixic acid. Okay? So with these results, I want to point out growth growth, 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 and growth, okay? Whereas here, sorry, the green doesn't show up that great. Let me see if blue shows up, okay. No growth, no growth, and no growth, okay? And on each one, notice the way they're labeled is strain one, on the left, and then strain two is on the right, okay? If you have any questions or concerns, send me a message in the Remind app as always. Okay, this will be your results set number two that the Post Lab will ask you to analyze. Again, since it's blurry, I'm just gonna write that this is LB plus strep plus AMP, okay? So the whole plate has both antibiotics present, Okay, we have no growth. Again, it's blurry, so you can't see. So no growth here for one. No growth in this section here for strain two. And then this here, strain three, that is growth. Okay. And then the very last one, what this says is it is LB plus maledixic acid. It is strain three streaked on there. And that there is no growth anywhere on the plate. Okay. So that is it for today's lesson. If you have any questions or concerns, just let me know and make sure that you let me uh, see your Remind app answers, okay, for this lesson. Okay, contact me anytime, any questions. Thank you and have a wonderful day.